Hey Rebel EM YouTube followers. I realized looking back through some of my video files that I had not done a video on sympathetic crashing acute pulmonary edema or SCAPE for short um, because I think this is a fun diagnosis and the management of it is also a lot of fun. And so I thought I would just spend a few minutes talking about how I go about managing these patients. So the problem here is that there's two things going on. So with the sympathetic surge that you get in these patients, you get decreased venous capacitance, which means you get venoconstriction, which increases venous return back to the heart. But then you also get arterial uh, vasoconstriction, which increases afterload on the heart. And so the net result of that is you basically end up getting this kind of flash pulmonary edema. So it's not really a volume problem. It's more of a redistribution of volume that ends up in the lungs because it gets trapped because it's pinched off on both sides. So when we talk about the treatment of this, there's three primary things that I hear repeated over and over and over again, and that's diuretics, non-invasive ventilation, and nitroglycerin. And so I want to go through each one of these. So the first thing is diuretics. I'm not really using diuretics in the acute setting. And the reason for that is, is that here's a couple of studies that just kind of drive my point home, but essentially published in 2008 and 2011 respectively, these patients that go from non-decompensated to decompensated, they get a lot of pulmonary edema and congestion, but don't really have weight gain. And a lot of these patients um, actually have not been eating and drinking very much because they haven't been feeling well. Um, and so diuretics may not be the thing to give them here. The sec second thing I would tell you is that this is a volume redistribution problem because of all the venoconstriction and arterial constriction. And so it's not a matter of too much volume. It's a matter of they're pinched off on both sides and our treatments need to focus on two things. Number one, improving their work of breathing, um, recruiting atelectatic alveoli, and the second is to try and get the venous side and the arterial side to kind of dilate a little bit more to allow that volume to kind of move through. So for me, diuretics, I don't find them useful in the acute setting. And so I'm not using them, but I do hear people talking about them all the time. So now let's move on to non-invasive ventilation. So whether you use BiPAP or CPAP doesn't matter. Um, they're probably equally efficacious in this disease process. I personally use BiPAP, um, but if you use CPAP, there's nothing wrong with that. My initial settings for my inspiratory pressure, I usually start these patients at 12, and for my expiratory pressure, I start them at 6. And I really do a lot of coaching up front to get them to kind of tolerate the mask a little bit better. Now, after a few minutes, if I realize that they still have a lot of work of breathing, they're tachypnic, I will increase both my inspiratory pressure and my expiratory pressure by two. Um, and I usually will give people about two to five minutes to see if they're going to do okay. And if I need to go up, I'll keep going up um, until they get to a more kind of comfortable level. Now, some patients are just going to be agitated and they're not going to tolerate this. If you're in the pre-hospital world, Morphine 2 milligrams IV or fentanyl 50 micrograms IV kills both respiratory drive and work of breathing. Um, for me, when I'm in the hospital, this is where I'm looking at things like dexmedetomidine and low-dose ketamine uh, to kind of try and help with that work of breathing and that agitation that the patient has. Non-invasive ventilation is going to be key. This is going to be the primary thing you're going to do for this patient that's going to help the most. It's going to reduce their work of breathing. It's going to decrease their pre and their afterload, and it's going to prevent them from getting intubated, all of which are great things. Now, nitroglycerin is interesting because uh, when we talk about nitroglycerin, uh, people are talking about starting drips at like five or 10 mics per minute, and that is not what I'm doing here. Um, I'm giving these patients typically a bolus and the bolus of nitroglycerin that I'm giving them intravenously is dependent on their blood pressure. This is just kind of a, a ballpark gauge of like what I do. If they have a systolic pressure of greater than 200, I'm giving them a full thousand micrograms. If they're between 180 and 199, I do 800. And if they're between 160 and 179, I give them 600 micrograms. Now, when you go and talk to people about man, that's a lot of nitroglycerin. I don't feel comfortable doing that. I think it's important to realize that the sublingual nitroglycerin that we give people for acute coronary syndrome um, is 0.4 milligrams, which is 400 micrograms. 
and we will go up to three times when we give it to those patients. And so this isn't that far off or that crazy. And after I give the bolus, I then start them on a drip of 100 to 200 micrograms per minute, not this homeopathic dose of 5 to 10 micrograms per minute. And then the way I titrate this is... If the patient is having symptoms that are still continuing and they're still hypertensive, I'll take my drip up by anywhere from 20 to 30 micrograms per minute every 10 minutes or so. If their symptoms are improving, the way I start to wean it off is I do the exact same thing, but in the opposite direction, 20 to 30 micrograms every 10 minutes until we're finally off. So nitroglycerin, much like non-invasive ventilation, reduces work of breathing, decreases preload and afterload, more so preload than afterload, um, and then also prevents intubation. So there's the three potential modalities. Now, some patients will still continue to be hypertensive. And for those patients, I will consider things like nicardipine or clavetipine um, as a drip. And the reason I like those is because they're arterial vasodilators, whereas the nitroglycerin works more on the venous side, these will work more on the arterial side, and so will help decrease afterload even more. I would avoid beta blockers in these patients, and, and I've seen this mistake made, because you're going to impair pump function. Um, you're not going to just drop blood pressure, you're also going to drop inotropy, and that's going to be a detrimental to these patients. So this is the one time that you want to stay away from uh, beta blocker boluses or even beta blocker drips. So in short, patient with scape, the issues are decreased venous capacitance, which means increased venoconstriction and fluid coming back to the heart and increased afterload, not allowing fluid to get out of the heart, causing redistribution of fluid and flash pulmonary edema. Diuretics, not really going to be helpful here. Non-invasive ventilation and nitroglycerin are going to be your friends and the patient's friend. So there you go. Sympathetic crashing acute pulmonary edema. That's the way I manage these patients. Would love to hear your thoughts, comments, and questions. And until next time.